and good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Duran Ishad, and I am Secretary Spice Truth Pakistan. On behalf of Spice Truth Wonka Young Doctors Movement South Asia, I welcome you all in today's webinar, which is organized to celebrate World Diabetes Day. Uh, Diabetes mellitus is one of the most uh, commonly encountered disease in the family practice. And according to the recent uh, data, around 20 to 30% of the patients visiting family practice have diabetes or one of its complications. So it's very important to discuss uh, this disease and to see what role we can play as family practitioners. So moving on towards uh, today's session, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sankar Randini Kumara, who is the Regional Chair of the Spice Route for the introductory remarks. Dr. Sankar is a family practitioner from Sri Lanka. Uh, he is an active member of uh, College of General Practitioner of Sri Lanka and also council member of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Under his leadership, Spice Route has taken multiple initiatives and one of them is to organize these webinars uh, in which we get a chance to discuss and share and uh, in fact to learn and share from each other's knowledge and experiences. So over to Dr. Sankar. Right. Thank you Noor for that uh, superfluous uh, introduction. <laughs> anyway, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, and uh, I would like to wish happy Diwali to all our Hindu colleagues. And uh, also many of our colleagues were uh, worrying about uh, participating in this uh, webinar because of this uh, Diwali festival and they have to uh, participate in that. But uh, I am happy to say that uh, this webinar is being recorded and that will be uh, on uh, our the Spice Road uh, Facebook page and the uh, and also on Wonka uh, Facebook page. So anybody who's willing to willing to watch this again, they are welcome to watch it later on. So so again, good evening everybody and thank you for joining. Uh, I would like to welcome you all, especially uh, Professor Shamali Samaranayaka. Uh, uh, Dr. Anam Beg from Pakistan and uh, my friend and brother uh, Kailas from India, who are the resource person for persons for the webinar today. Uh, today's webinar is about diabetes. I mean, today is the World Diabetes Day, and the diabetes is one of the most, or say, I would say that is the Worst disease, the whoever, any person would experience. Because if you take a cancer, most of the time, if you detect the cancer early, you can cure it or you can either limit whatever the consequences uh, to a very you know, low level. When you take AIDS, you have treatment now. But when you take diabetes, it's not like that. It would be there with you every day till you die. So today on the World Diabetes Day, we are going to uh, rethink and reiterate about the importance of one, preventing diabetes and also early detecting diabetes and how we are going to do the secondary prevention and so on as the family physicians or the doctors who are closest to the hearts of the community or the patients. Um, so with that, I think uh, while welcoming you all again, I would like to uh, hand over this again to Noor. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's that Dure who's going to uh, who's going to moderate the session, Dure, uh, and uh, go ahead with the rest of the things. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sanka, for the remarks. And uh, yes, it's Dure. Uh, so moving on towards our first uh, talk, 
which is on the topic which is very important to realize the global and the regional burden of the diabetes as we all know that it's also labeled as to be an epidemic. And for this, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kailas from India. So we are very thankful to Dr. Kailas for taking out time and also happy Diwali on, and taking out time on a festival day. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Kailas. He's a medical uh, officer at, in Kerala Government Health Services and is uh, presently working in COVID control team of Palakkar District. Diabetology, palliative care, and geriatrics are his areas of special interest. And he also holds possession of FM360 coordinator in Spice Root India. So over to Dr. Kela. Thank you, Dure, for the uh, nice welcome. So I'll start, I just share my screen and we'll start, uh, start the presentation. Is it visible? Hello. Yes. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, good evening to you all. Greetings from India and happy Diwali to you all. And on this World Diabetes Day, it was indeed a pleasure for me to be given a chance to talk on this topic, uh, global and regional burden of diabetes. So straight away, I'm going to the topic. What is diabetes mellitus? It's a, oh, it's a, it is a serious long-term chronic condition that occurs when there is high levels of glucose in person's blood because their body cannot produce uh, any or, or enough of the hormone insulin or cannot uh, affect uh, the use when it is produced. So cannot effectively use the insulin it produces. Now, why diabetes is so important? What are the problems? Insulin deficit, if left unchecked over the long term, can cause damage to many of the body's organs, leading to disabling and life-threatening complications, such as cardiovascular disease, nerve damage, kidney damage, and eye disease. However, if appropriate management of diabetes is achieved, these serious complications can be delayed or prevented altogether. Yes, this is the area where we fellow family physicians or primary care physicians have a crucial role in. Now, what's happening across the world? In 2000, you can see from the figures, I have taken all my data from IDF uh, Atlas of 2019. And in 2000, the global estimate of diabetes prevalence in age group of 20 to 79 years age group, you can see that the prevalence was around 151 million people in 2000. But estimates have since shown an alarming increase, tripping to around 463 million people affected by diabetes in 2019. This represents 9.3 percentage of the world population in this age group. And future projections also shows that the continuity is continu continuity of this alarming increase, reaching around 578 million by 2030 and around 700 million people by 2045. And this is a world map showing the estimated total number of adults with diabetes in 2019. You can see the countries in dark red, that is India, China, United States, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Brazil are the highest affected regions in all of the world, where, most, where the highest number of people with diabetes are living. And diabetes estimates shows a typically increasing prevalence of diabetes by age also. Similar trends are predicted for the years 2030 and 2045 also. Now, Estimated prevalence is slightly lower in women that is compared to men. That is around 9 percentage is the prevalence in women and with 9.6 prevalent, 9.6 uh, percentage of prevalence in men. Expected prevalence is likely to increase both in men and women by 2030 and 2045. And in 2019, more people with diabetes are living in urban areas. That is around 10.8 percentage that is 310 million people are living in urban areas than in the rural areas, which is only around 152.6 million people. And prevalence of diabetes is expected to increase in urban areas in 2030 and 2045. Now, in this slide, you can see the number of adults living as uh, number of adults living with diabetes as per World Bank income classification. You can see that here, the high income countries and middle income countries have higher prevalence of diabetes compared to the low income countries. And the projection also shows that by 2045, uh, the gap between the high income and middle income countries is narrowed and maybe it's due to the rapid urbanization of the world population. 
and these are the 10 countries or territories for number of adults uh, living with diabetes you can see as i already told china india united states and pakistan are the first four places and the future projection shows that pakistan if the current trends trend goes on pakistan may overtake united states and take the third position by 2045 and coming to uh, the number of people older than 65 years with diabetes uh, you can see you can see that um, almost all the people all all the countries are equally affected uh, all the, all the all the countries are equally having the equally uh, distributed the uh, number of people with 65 more than 65 years with diabetes and a prevalence of this slide shows that in greatest great, older than 65 years the prevalence of diabetes is around 20 percentage and it will remain so in 2030 and 2045 now can we, uh, coming to the undiagnosed diabetes in 2019 one in two that is around 50.1 percentage or 20 231.9 million of 463 million adults living with diabetes are unaware that they have this condition these estimates point to an urgent need for prompt detection of improved global screening of diabetes so uh, here is a world map showing the number of adults with undiagnosed diabetes in 2009 which shows the same trend as we said earlier india china united states pakistan and brazil are the top five countries and this uh, this is the same thing and coming to the global burden of type 1 diabetes it's uh, that is around 1 million people are there are 1 million existing people uh, children or adolescents living in the world with type 1 diabetes and every year around 128900 people new new day, new type 1 cases are being detected all around the world and the top 10 uh, in the top 10 countries again shows india united states and brazil are the Uh, first three countries with number of new cases and also the number of estimate existing cases in uh, type 1 diabetes now compared to coming to the uh, impaired glucose in, impaired glucose tolerance why impaired glucose tolerance is very uh, very, very important because they pose a significant risk of developing diabetes mellitus and this is an important target for primary prevention in 2019 approximately 7.5 percentage of the world population is having impaired glucose tolerance and which may rise as the future projection shows it may rise to 8 percentage in 2030 and to 8.6 percentage in 2045 and this slide also shows that 50 percentage of those with impaired glucose tolerance are below the age of 50 years so it is important to note that nearly one third of all those who are currently have impaired glucose tolerance are in uh, 20 to 39 years of age group and therefore likely to spend many years at risk of type 2 diabetes and adverse cardiovascular disease outcomes and coming to hyperglycemia in pregnancy that is out of the total 129.5 million uh, live births happening in any year the approximately 15.8 percentage that is around 20.4 million of the live births are affected by some kind of hyperglycemia in pregnancy out of which 83.6 percentage are due to gestational diabetes mellitus 8.5 percentage are due to other types of diabetes first de detected in pregnancy and 7.9 percentage of uh, cases are due to diabetes detected prior to pregnancy and coming to deaths related to diabetes approximately 4.2 million adults aged 20 to 79 years are estimated to die as a result of diabetes and its complication in 2019 and this is equivalent to one death every 8 seconds that's an alarming point one death every 8 seconds and coming to the economic impact of diabetes yes economic Im impact uh, can be discussed under two headings one are the one is the dark cost of diabetes mellitus and the others are the indirect cost of diabetes and in 2019 it was uh, estimated that around 760 billion us dollars uh, Uh, are uh, uh, spent uh, uh, spent for diabetes, and which which will uh, increase to around 825 billion US dollars in 2030, and to 845 billion US dollars in 2045. And regarding the indirect cost of diabetes, and some study conducted by Mr. Bomber et al. 
uh, overall estimate of indirect cost of diabetes is that this constitute 34.7 percentage of the total global estimate of cost of diabetes of US dollars of around 1.31 trillion. And the four sources of indirect cost considered by Bomer et al are labor force dropout, mortality, absenteeism, and presenteeism. And at a glance, what we have, at a glance, what we have discussed so far, in a population of 7.7 .7 billion world population, in an adult of adult population of 5 billion, global prevalence of diabetes is 9.3 percentage, and that is around 463 million people are living with diabetes, and around 4.2 million deaths are happening, and total expenditure of around 760 billion US dollars are happening for diabetes, with 15.8 percentage of live births affected with some kind of hyperglycemia and a global prevalence of 7.5 percentage of impaired glucose tolerance is present and um, around 1 million people are affected with type 1 diabetes all around the world and the projections are also being given in the slide for 2030 and 2045. Now coming to the regional regional burden that is in South Asia what uh, what we can see is with around 997.4 million adult population the regional prevalence is only 8.8 percentage that is, number of people living with diabetes is around 87.6 million. And the total health expenditure in US dollars is only 8.1 billion. This is one of the uh, lowest among the, all the regions, uh, all the regions for diabetes related health expenditure. And the regional prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance is 3.1 percentage. And the next thing, the undiagnosed diabetes, the regional prevalence is 56.7 percentage. That is a very big, huge number. That is 56.7 percentage people are undiagnosed and living with undiagnosed diabetes and they are more prone to uh, have complications and more impact on the economy also it will create. And around 1,84,000 uh, people are living with type 1 diabetes uh, with around 21,300 new cases detected every year. And in Southeast Asian region, 8.4 percentage of the total health, health expenditure was allocated to diabetes. The highest percentage was in Mauritius, that is around 16.9 percentage, and the lowest was in Nepal, 4.2 percentage. The highest estimate in 2019 for mean annual expenditure per person with diabetes in this region was US dollars 1794 in Maldives, while the lowest was US dollars 64 in Bangladesh. In India, which accounts for 87.9 percentage of adults living with diabetes in the region, US dollars 92 was spent per person. And these are some of the data uh, regarding uh, the South, South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Mauritius, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And IDF uh, calculates, uh, classifies Pakistan in the Mediterranean region. So the data is separate from the other group, not in the Southeast Asia. So I have taken and uh, put the same data also here, which I'm not going, uh, not going to discuss in detail. Now, uh, before concluding, what are the key points that we have seen uh, in this topic? Around the world, in 2019, only 463 million people were affected with diabetes, which may rise up to uh, 700 million in 2000. That is a 51 percentage increase is expected in the next 25 years. And in Southeast Asia, uh, from 88 million, it may reach up to 153 million. That is around a 74, 74 percentage increase is expected to happen. And what all we have learned, the estimated number of an estimated 463 million adults aged 20 to 79 years are currently living with diabetes, which represents 9.3 percentage of the world population in this age group. And it may predict to rise to 578 million and 700 million by 2045. And the estimated number of adults aged 20 to 79 years with impaired glucose tolerance is 374 million. That is 7.5 percentage of the world population in this age group. An estimated 1.1 million children and adolescents have type 1 diabetes. And the number of deaths resulting from diabetes and its complication in 2019 is estimated to be 4.2 million. An estimated 15.8 percentage of live births are affected by hyperglycemia in pregnancy in 2019. And annual global health expenditure on diabetes is around 760 US bill, billion US dollars. And it is projected that the expenditure will reach around 825 billion US dollars by 2030 and 845 billion US dollars by 2045. Keeping this in mind, let's move on to the other uh, presentations and see what, uh, what's happening across the, uh, what, what we can do and what we can uh, think ahead for diabetes in primary care or family practice. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Kalas. And uh, I think you very rightly summarized that the numbers are alarming and uh, Pakistan and India will be expected to be in the top five countries of the world to have this disease and definitely its complications and an economic burden. So the next topic is very relevant and important that what is the role of the primary care in prevention and screening of diabetes? So there's a, around 56.7% uh, people you mentioned they're living with undiagnosed diabetes. Uh, so there uh, comes the role of screening. And I would like to introduce our next speaker. We're honored to have Professor Shaimali Samarnaika. Uh, she's head of family medicine department and the faculty of medical sciences at University of Sri Jayavardhanepura. She's also chairperson of board of studies in family medicine, postgraduate institute of medicine. She is an exam convener for MRCGP South Asia International Exam. Research has been her areas of interest, and she has 14 publications in peer-reviewed journals and 33 abstract publications. She has been awarded three presidential awards and one National Research Council Award for publication, and also fellowship of College of General Practitioner of Sri Lanka. So over to ma'am. Thank you, Spice Ruth, for inviting me to do this presentation. Good evening to all of you, and happy Diwali to the friends celebrating from uh, India and other parts who are joining with us. Um, I can't share my screen. Can you enable me to? Uh, Senab, Adur. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, okay. Yeah, now I can, yeah. Can you do it now? So, uh, following on uh, to Kailash, I'm going to talk about role of the primary care in prevention and screening of diabetes. So uh, this is the overview of my presentation. And uh, the need, of course, after the speech of uh, Kailash, I think I don't have to really say much about the need. It's very obvious, the increasing prevalence globally, as well as in the South Asian region, and the complication profile, uh, I mean, we know the diabetes can cause complications from head to toe and serious complications like um, amputations, blindness, cardiovascular events, cerebrovascular accidents. So uh, with that, the uh, amount of the expenditure, again, Kailash touched upon the cost of uh, treating diabetes and the complications is so huge and the uh, effects of uh, early detection, prevention and delaying diabetes will definitely delay the onset of complications and thereby the health burden to the individuals, to the families and to the country economics and even to the region will be uh, reduced if we can do this prevention or delaying the onset, and especially with the uh, aging population or the longer life expectancy. If people develop diabetes early, then they will develop complications also early and they will live for a longer time with complications, uh, with, uh, which will in return increase the burden to uh, everybody. So, uh, we can actually start uh, preventing diabetes from a very early stage. So primary prevention has a role in here where we, the preventive measures that will pre pre uh, sort of prevent or delay the onset of illness before the disease process begins is the primary prevention. So how can we actually do this in relation to diabetes? There are evidence to support even the intrauterine growth retardation will increase the risk of diabetes in uh, their later life. So 
we can start very early by preventing IUGR in newborns. I'll come to the details as to how we will be doing as GPs a little bit later. And also maintaining a healthy body weight from the childhood up until uh, to the adulthood. Being Asian people, we know all of us uh, will adore chubby babies. So mothers want the babies to be chubby. So as family physicians, again, we have a very big role to play in changing these in, uh, like uh, beliefs and the images they have about uh, being healthy. And also we know the extremes of uh, body weights like very low and very high, both are bad. Uh, in uh, when it comes to the uh, diabetes. So it's paramount that we promote healthy body weight from a very younger age. And to do that, we need to promote healthy lifestyle uh, for everybody. Again, diet and the exercise goes a long way when it comes to diabetes prevention. I'll discuss this again in detail. So actually secondary prevention is screening and managing to prevent complications. But here we talk a lot about screening. The importance of screening is very, very high when it comes to diabetes. We all heard according to Kailash, we have 56.7% of undiagnosed diabetes in South Asian region. So only with effective screening program, we will be able to detect these people in order to uh, get them uh, to uh, our treatment regimes and control their diabetes uh, in order to prevent complications. So screening is the process of identifying those individuals who are at risk uh, of a specific disorder. In general, there are certain principles when we talk of screening. I'm just putting for the sake of completeness. So the condition should be an important health problem. There should be a recognizable latent or early asymptomatic period where we could uh, diagnose uh, the disease early. There should be facilities to diagnose and uh, there should be an acceptable treatment for patient with uh, diagnosis and acceptable test, which is cost effect on population basis. And there should be agreed upon policy of management plans for the patients and cost of finding the cases and the benefit of treating early should be uh, uh, beneficial and health expenditure point of view. So, when it comes to diabetes, it almost, I mean, it fulfills all these criteria. No doubt about the rising prevalence of diabetes worldwide. And the available tests, the screening are very low cost and affordable for most of the people and populations and to the countries. These tests are very much have a very high sensitivity and specificity. So we can reliably use them for the purpose of diagnosis. And we have effective interventions and treatment plans developing day by day to combat diabetes. Clearly defined diagnostic points and treatment plans we have, and there is substantial evidence of the benefit with early diagnosis. So again, going back to what the previous presentation, we know a very large proportion of people with diabetes are asymptomatic or underdiagnosed. Again, a very well-known fact is a substantial proportion of newly diagnosed patients already have evidence of microvascular complications of diabetes. So again, this is very, very important thing. If we diagnose early, we can actually catch them before they develop these complications, which will in turn uh, improve their outcome uh, when it comes to long-term diabetes. 
there are serious long-term complications of diabetes, which we will be hearing in our next presentation. And there is definite evidence of efficacy of intensive blood glucose control in preventing or delaying the complications of diabetes. So how can we test? What are the tests available? There's an array of tests available from very low sensitive to very sensitive. So uh, if you take urine glucose test, very crude test, that maybe it's very cost effective in especially population screening wise. And wherever we find people with low, I mean, urine glucose positive, then we can send them for definitive testing. So maybe a gross screening procedure, we can use it still. Again, capillary blood glucose is not very accurate, but very important, especially now, I'm sure all of us are involved in these health camps and things where we go for community screening. So when we do not have facilities to do the plasma glucose, capillary blood glucose again is a very good alternative uh, to arrive not really for diagnostic purposes, but as a screening tool where again we can get them to do the confirmatory test to diagnose. Venous plasma glucose and glycated hemoglobin are the things that we use actually for the diagnostic purpose. Again, we need to be mindful about the place of glycated hemoglobin in patients with low hemoglobin and hemoglobinopathies. So this is just again for the sake of completeness, I'm putting, I know all of you are aware about the cutoffs of the plasma glucose uh, fasting and NHB1C for diabetes. Important thing, again, to diagnose with one plasma glucose or a prandial glucose, if that is not a glucose tolerance, we, the patient has to be symptomatic or should present in a hyperglycemic crisis. That is one important thing for the diagnostic criteria. Diabetes, we have a very good window of opportunity, actually. That is the pre-diabetes stage. So if, from screening, if we can detect this, the pre-diabetes stage, that is the fasting glucose of 100 to 125, prandial glucose of 140 to 199, and again, HbA1c of 5.4 to 6.4. Now, this is a very good opportunity actually to prevent diabetes and uh, there's very much positive evidence that intervention at this stage actually can delay the onset of diabetes or the incidence of diabetes in substantial amounts. I'll get back to that in a little while. So how are we going to do this screening? Two main approaches we can adopt as family physicians. Targeted screening for people at risk. So whenever we see a patient coming uh, to our practices which belong to high risk category, then we can initiate screening. Or else, very famous thing again for family medicine or being family physicians, the opportunistic screening. So patient may come for some other problem, or maybe a problem of another family member, we get hold of them, we catch them at that opportunity, we take that opportunity to do this uh, screening in a routine consultations. So who are at high risk? Now, uh, this is actually, uh, I took this from our uh, endocrinologist and the college uh, guidelines for Sri Lanka, but I'm sure this is applicable to most of South Asia. So uh, individuals aged more than 40, again, we just heard, we now see the onset of diabetes is much earlier. I mean, type two diabetes, we can see much early in certain individuals. So if they're at high risk, then we have to still screen and actually 
in our practices, we start opportunistic screening. This is actually under the high risk category, but opportunistic screening, we start even earlier, maybe even at the age of 30. So overweight BMI we take as more than 23 because it is the Asian region, Asian uh, overweight cutoff point. First degree relative with type two diabetes and women with gestational diabetes or has given birth to an overweight baby that is more than 3.5 kg at birth. And individuals with diagnosed uh, previous impaired fasting or glucose tolerance. Then uh, hypertensive people and people with dyslipidemia, they have a, a tendency to develop hyperglycemia as well part of metabolic syndrome. So if we have people with hyperlipidemia or hypertension, again, we need to uh, screen them for diabetes as well. We know there are other medical conditions associated with insulin resistance, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, acanthosis, or we have patients who are on long-term steroids for various other complications. So high-risk people, we need to screen. Also, people who have vascular disease, again, we need to screen them as well for diabetes because people can have uh, more, they, there is will become more if they have diabetes as well. How frequently do we have to screen? If the initial test is in the normal range, then the recommendation is three yearly if they do not have any additional risk factors. However, if the uh, initial test is in the pre-diabetic range, then yearly we need to do the screening. And depending on the risk status of the individual's frequency can be changed. So coming back to our main part, the role of primary care, where are we and what are we going to do with our population when it comes to prevention of diabetes and screening? So why primary care? Because we are Actually, we, we are the people who know about the individual and the family the best. The relationship we have with our patients, they will take our advice without much hesitance, especially when it comes to lifestyle advice. They need somebody they have a good relationship and trust to follow those uh, instructions. We are providing first contact. So what? Whatever the problem they have, individual, maybe the family members, they will come to us. So that is a very good opportunity to uh, uh, get hold of them for the screening purposes. And the knowledge we have about the individual and the family, we can really provide this personalized care. So we know their lifestyle, what they're doing, who is there in the family. So we can have an individualized care plan in order to prevent and uh, screen for these people. So, and because we provide continuity of care with our medical records, plus follow up, uh, that do, again, this is very important. When we try to do lifestyle changes, the continuity is very, very important because if we give just one off advice, then very unlikely for that to be successful. That is a very, very well known fact. If you do not reinforce, if you do not follow up, that the lifestyle interventions or the main stay of preventing diabetes, we are going to miss. And we do have access to the family. Again, this is very important because sometimes uh, we get our uh, middle-aged men coming with maybe impaired glucose or in the high-risk category. Whatever we say about how to prepare their meals and what to take and things, um, very unlikely even they go and tell in their households. We know that as a fact. So we need I mean, because we know the family, we can get hold of the person who is cooking, probably the wife, and then advise 
about how to do the meal that will be for the entire family because we know when the parents are having diabetes, the children are at risk. So we can target the entire family and we can give health advice to the entire family. That is actually the beauty of primary care and the importance of primary care in this venture. So this is the main reason actually the WHO, the World Bank and the governments in the uh, region really looking at promoting primary care to overcome or combat the NCD epidemic, especially the diabetes, because our ability in uh, catching these people early and the ability of motivating people to do this very, very important lifestyle changes. So again, most of you are familiar with this family life cycle. So where can we start? This is our prevention part of diabetes. Actually, the very stage one of family life cycle where the married couple, no children. So as family physicians, we can improve the health of the girl child by Doing that, we can prevent the intra-infant growth retardation of the child. We are looking after them during the pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, so uh, just uh, correcting the nutrition as well as uh, looking after them for other probable uh, con conditions which would give rise to IUGR will help in preventing the uh, diabetes in the offsprings. Similarly, if we advise them about their lifestyle being healthy during pregnancy, they will prevent, if we can prevent gestational diabetes among them, then the girls also will be safe uh, when it comes to diabetes in the future. So again, in the next stages, like stage two, three, we need to advise on uh, physical exercise for the uh, mothers because we know, uh, again, sort of cultural, when they preoccupy with the children, they tend to neglect themselves. They don't look after, they don't go for regular exercises. They don't care about their diet. They think they need to feed, they eat really well. So they actually put their, uh, the they themselves at risk of developing diabetes in the future. Again, as I told you before, the weight management of children at this age is very important. We should somehow prevent the obesity among children in order to prevent diabetes uh, in the future among them. So when it comes to the stage four of the family life cycle, where the children start schooling, this is the time the parents become high risk of developing diabetes, 30 to 40 years, that range. So they may come with their children to us. It's up to us to catch them and get them to do the screening for diabetes as well as reinforce their uh, attitudes about the healthy lifestyle in order to prevent diabetes. So uh, one word about managing pre-diabetes because uh, I, uh, the next speaker is going to talk about managing diabetes. So I'm just touching on pre-diabetes management because this is a very good opportunity for us to delay the onset of diabetes because uh, again, we have evidence coming from DPP study and the Finnish uh, DPS study where the intensive uh, lifestyle or behavioral modifications has reduced the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 58% up to uh, over three years. So that is a very, very huge number actually. So, and this is not very difficult to inculcate among our patients in a family practice setting. And a cessation of tobacco use is uh, to reduce the uh, diabetes, then becoming diabetes as well as preventing cardiovascular complications. 
um, use of metformin controversial in certain uh, scenarios, but again, uh, they, they are providing level A evidence of uh, using metformin to people with uh, BMI more than 35 kilograms. So that is hugely overweight people or like obese people, uh, there's a definite benefit. And also they have shown some evidence to pe in people less than 60 years and gestational diabetes patients uh, to treat the pre-diabetes status with metformin. Of course, again, they also, they highlight the importance of lifestyle. They emphasize lifestyle effect is very much more than metformin. And uh, we need to monitor and treat for other CVD risk factors uh, like hypertension and dyslipidemia in these pre-diabetes patients. We have to do annual screening of blood sugar levels in pre-diabetes to catch them early, uh, the moment they get into the real diabetes status. And uh, a little bit more about behavioral and lifestyle modifications. Again, uh, according to DPP study, they recommend a 7 to 10% of weight reduction over six months uh, to uh, prevent uh, the pre-diabetes patient going into the diabetes state. So that is about one to two pounds a week, uh, not more than that. How can we do that? So calorie restriction is one important thing. So uh, again, we need to consider about the amount of food they are taking and the quality of food they are taking. So uh, whether it's the carbs has to be refined, uh, not refined carbs. Therefore, uh, like uh, bran and uh, the, uh, the cereals, those things uh, will be good fruits, vegetables has to be encouraged in the food. And the, uh, they also carry about the beneficial effect of nuts, berries, yogurt, coffee, and tea in uh, preventing diabetes and preventing cardiovascular event, but no very sort of solid evidence still. Again, uh, exercises, uh, they say 150 minutes per week moderate in intensity and minimum of 10 minutes drop. This is again something important to us as family physicians because we know it's how difficult to motivate our people to do a 30 minute at a stretch. So even 10 minute slots is enough if they can achieve the target. And they can do strength and training uh, up to 75 minutes uh, a week and uh, Reducing prolonged sedentary time. This is very much they are into this now, even in our, I mean, in Sri Lanka, the health ministry has introduced this even for the officers whenever they are having meetings to stop in between and to move around a bit just to uh, break this prolonged sedentary time because it has been proven to have an effect in uh, weight management and uh, I mean, towards NCDs. Actually, this behavioral therapy, they say not only reduce the uh, mortality benefits uh, or morbidity benefits towards diabetes, but overall mortality and mortality due to cardiovascular events also has been reduced with this uh, weight reduction or lifestyle modification. So, uh, Lastly, few practical points or the traps actually we get into very often. We need to take a proper history from our patients. When we ask past history, I mean, I'm sure all of you are very familiar. Do you have diabetes? No, doctor, I don't have anything. So you also happily move okay and then you go. But stop and ask, have you checked? Most of our people will say, no, doctor, I didn't check, but I don't have any problem. So I don't have diabetes, right? So that is a very, very common thing in our clinical setup. I'm 
hundred percent sure almost all of you are familiar with this scenario. So make sure you cross check. Have you checked? When you ask about, have you checked? Then they say, yes, doctor, I checked and it was normal. Please ask, when did you check? Yes, they would say, I it was checked when I was pregnant, doctor. Or about five years back, it was checked and it was normal, doctor. I don't have anything, so I don't have diabetes. Okay. So our people are in very much denial. They don't want to have the disease. So they will say, no, I am fine. Because actually, we also know they are fine, especially in the pre-diabetes stage. They don't have any symptoms or even diabetes until their sugar levels come up to a substantial level, they are asymptomatic. So make sure you clarify, double check about what they are saying when they say they don't have diabetes. And also, when you're taking the history, when you want to do this lifestyle modification, please ask about their lifestyle. Because we all know our plate method, uh, this method, that method, food pyramid, everything. And we have one cup of rice and I mean standard diets we have in our mind because we have learned. But can we actually apply into our real patients? If you just ask, if you, I mean, tell them, okay, eat one cup of rice and this like that and the other. So they will, I mean, won't be faithful to the doctor. So they eat one cup. And in, I mean, for the person who had been eating three cups, one cup means nothing. In one, one hour time, he's hungry and he will eat three more cups and the purpose lost. So make sure you just ask about the individual lifestyle. And again, you advise on exercising. You say, okay, you need to exercise 150 minutes, like 30 minutes a day for five days a week. Just think, how many of us are doing it? So will our patients do it, right? So it has to be something practical. If we can link something to their lifestyle, then maybe they will do something. So as I said before also, if they can't devote just 30 minutes at a stretch, maybe 15 minutes, two slots, 10 minutes, three slots, whatever is practical, depending on their lifestyle. And whenever we advise, try to advise not only to the individual, but to the family and make it a family routine, family diet, family exercise time. So that will improve the unity of the family and it will improve the compliance to whatever the lifestyle programs that you are trying to give. And personalized plan, that's what actually I said before, like knowing about our patients, and there are other disease conditions, their income level, their level of education, the level of understanding are very important when we give them a lifestyle plan. And frequent follow-ups are mandatory with appreciation and encouragement whenever even if they have gained slight benefit, maybe a bit of weight reduction or if they're adhering to a routine exercise program or if they're at least trying to follow the diet, encourage them because they respect you a lot as the family physician and your encouragement, appreciation goes a long way and uh, frequent follow-ups, reinforcements are mandatory if we want to get a success with the lifestyle modification plan. So these are the like main things I wanted to highlight uh, in my talk as uh, family physicians, what we could do, how we could do, and how we could avoid some traps that we are getting into frequently in order to uh, prevent our patients becoming diabetic. Thank you, Spice Root, for giving the opportunity, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, uh, for a very comprehensive presentation and highlighting this prevention and the role of the screening uh, for diabetes. I enjoyed your presentation and really enjoyed the practical points and hopefully all our participants and have learned a lot. So, so uh, over to Dr. Noor, uh, that there has been question by one of the attendees. Can you take that question? Here? No, you have to unmute. 
Do I have to unmute button. yourself? Okay, sorry. So we have Fazana Athas. Uh, she has raised her hand. Fazana, you want to ask something? Fazana, you can unmute yourself and then speak. Okay, no, I think maybe it's uh, some. Um, we'll take the questions last, maybe. So yeah, okay, we'll take it in the end. Okay. Maybe this is some technical glitch, which is occurred at the end. Thank you. Okay, then uh, moving on towards the last uh, presentation, which is again a very important topic, which is a holistic approach to prevent uh, complications of diabetes. And the last speaker is Dr. Anam Arshad Bey. She is Assistant Professor and Head of Department Family Medicine at Dow University of Health Sciences, Karachi. Uh, she's also Program Director of Postgraduate Training in Family Medicine at the university and also Academic Coordinator of eDoctor. Uh, which is an online learning program in family medicine for non-practicing female doctors at home. So over to Dr. Anand. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuddin and Shah. Uh, and hello and welcome, everybody. Good evening. And a happy Diwali to all those who are celebrating Diwali today. Uh, okay, let me start my screen sharing. If you give me a minute, please. So today, uh, I will be talking about the holistic approach to preventing complications of diabetes. Uh, the previous two speakers, esteemed speakers, have been very kind enough to give a very comprehensive uh, overview so far. And I'd say that actually it's made my talk much more simpler, much more easier. Thank you. Um, OK, I will not be going very much into the burden, which has already been covered very, very nicely by the first speaker. Uh, but just quickly giving a slight introduction, I'd say, from uh, this is taken from the World Health Organization fact sheet of 2020. So from 2000 to 2016, there was a 5% increase in premature mortality that was seen with diabetes. Now, this was the overall mortality, uh, which included the complications that were caused because of longstanding diabetes. Um, the burden of complications besides uh, the burden of diabetes itself is, of course, as has already been mentioned, rising very rapidly, but more so in the low and middle income countries. Um, diabetes, as we all know, is a major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, stroke, limb amputations. So you see there are multiple problems, all primarily because of uh, end organ damage or target organ damage. In 2016, an estimated 1.6 million deaths were directly caused by diabetes itself, and almost half of all deaths attributable to high blood glucose occur before the age of 70 years. So now we are talking about an age of maximum productivity. We are talking about an age group which is uh, responsible for contributing significantly to the workable uh, community and the society. The World Health Organization estimates that diabetes was the seventh leading cause of death by 2016. I'm sure it's been updated more, but this was the most recent that I found. So what do I mean by a holistic approach? How many of us know that? And why, why am I talking about a holistic approach? So we're talking about a comprehensive, complete care which is regarding diabetes itself, pre-diabetes, as was uh, previously mentioned by Professor Shandi. Um, and uh, then we're talking about uh, diabetes and its complications being the primary domain of family medicine. 
that is the concept of primary care, starting at the foundation of any disease, the cross root level. So when we're talking about pre-diabetes, if we are talking about preventing diabetes itself, and then we talk about, uh, in a way, secondary prevention in terms of preventing the complications that have been caused once diabetes has started. So we're talking about nipping it all in the bun, basically. Nipping it all in the bud. Um, okay, so next we have, uh, sorry, there's a slight uh, problem in this. We're talking about the comprehensive medical evaluation or the clinical, okay, so when we talk about the comprehensive medical evaluation, we start first of all um, by the clinical assessment, by which, of course, in it, the most important step is taking a complete history. The next is examination. So I've taken this from the American Diabetic Association guidelines of 2020, uh, quoting my reference. So what we have is uh, checking the blood pressure. How often does it need to be done at the initial visit, every follow-up, and then annually. Then we come to the skin inspection, initial visit, every follow-up, and then annually again. A complete dental assessment, initial visit, and then annually. A thyroid palpation at the initial visit, and then annual then dilated eye exam, again, initial visit and annual, a comprehensive foot exam, again, initial visit, and then annually. So this is the first step in providing comprehensive medical evaluation to preventing the complications, catching it, nipping it in the bud. The next that we have is investigation. So when we talk about investigations, uh, we talk about the spot urinary protein creatinine ratio, which is done annually. A lipid profile, again, on an annual basis, liver function tests annually, a TSH, which is, now we're talking about those which are uh, indicated in certain circumstances. For example, a TSH is done in type 1 diabetes, a vitamin B12 level if the patient is on metformin, serum creatinine, and estimated GFR when the patient is 65 years or older. So all of these investigations, as you can all understand, are aiming at preventing end organ damage or catching it, actually. Not just preventing it, but catching it as well. Now we come to the next step, or as I see it, the next component, the lifestyle modifications, which become a part and parcel of uh, any diabetes management with the aim of preventing what? The complications again. So when we talk about the medical nutrition therapy, this is not done in isolation by the primary care physician. This is more of a shared care, including the nutritionist as well. Then we go talk about physical. Now, these two points have already been very, very nicely put forward by Prof. Shan Lee. Um, uh, and she has very rightly mentioned that we can't just say that uh, we can uh, yeah, that, that if the patient has to follow a certain kind of dietary pattern. It has to be tailored according to the person who's affected, basically. Similarly, because otherwise the patient may hide uh, the, the facts from us. Then we come to physical activity, as recommended, is supposed to be 115 minutes a week um, with at least three consecutive days and no more than two days being exercise free in between. Moderation of alcohol intake, which means two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women, depending on the units of the drinks. Smoking or tobacco cessation if the patient uses it. And then the most important thing, addressing the psychosocial problem to understand what we're telling them, what, what kind of a support system do they have, how are they helped, basically. Again, I, I would say last but not the least would be that vaccinations, which are very, very important and in the hepatitis B vaccine. When we talk about the annual flu vaccine, what I, uh, sorry, the pneumococcal vaccine, I'd just quickly like to point out that when we talk about children who are less than two years of age, uh, we are talking about the PCB13 or the pneumococcal vaccine 13. When we talk about the individuals between two to 64 years of age, we're talking about the PCB13 followed up by the BPSV23, given six to 12 months later or at any point that the patient comes in. And at Silter, then to repeat the PPS, we 23, and hepatitis B vaccine to all those who have not presentation by a quick take home message. How do we prevent complications, basically? The timely and appropriate management of hyperglycemia right at the onset, 
keeping an eye out for the initial stages of any of the complications so that timely intervention can be provided. As I've already mentioned, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranam. Uh, nice presentation of highlighting the holistic approach. The examination need to be done by a family physician so that the complications can be prevented and also can be picked up earlier. So next, uh, uh, this brings us towards the end of our presentations. And uh, for Q&A session, uh, I would like to hand over to Dr. Noor, Noor who is a fm coordinator of Spice Food Pakistan, and also Dr. Zena, who's our chair of Spice Food Pakistan. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dure. Dr. Zena, do we have any questions? Uh, no, we don't have uh, any questions in the chat box as yet. If uh, any of the participants has any queries, so they can very well uh, note it down in the chat box and then we can address them to our uh, speaker. If not, uh, then we can uh, end the webinar. Zainab, there's a comment on FB. Uh, it's a okay. comment, okay. but I want to clarify it, uh, probably even from uh, Professor Shamali or else from uh, Dr. Beg. Um, okay. I think it's Dr. Rick has uh, commented that lifestyle medicine can reverse diabetes. So are we, I mean, uh, most of the time we tell that diabetes cannot be reversed. So is there any chance? That's it. Okay, so, so we can uh, direct this question to either Dr. Anam or uh, Professor Shamadi, uh, any of them, if they can answer this question for us. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Shamadi here. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, actually, uh, I don't know really, we can say whether we are reverting because once we like make a diagnosis, the diagnosis is there, but of course, we know in a patient with diagnosed diabetes with the, this medical nutrition therapy and with physical exercises, we can, of course, prevent them even taking medications because we have like patients who are on only lifestyle modifications over a long period of time. So maybe that's what he is referring to, but I really don't know because it's the pathology which has taken place whether we are reverting the... Uh, the entire thing, I don't know, but the, de definitely the sugar control will be normal. I mean, can we can make it normal with the medical nutrition therapy as well as uh, thereby we can reduce the complications and things uh, on the long term. Uh, if I don't um, mind me adding, I agree with Professor uh, that so far, whatever it is, as, uh, we've seen so far, definitely, as I agree with it, as far as pre diabetes is concerned, uh, definitely we've seen long term management on diet, but going back and reversing is yet to be seen, I believe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anam and Dr. Shamadi, for um, answering this question for us. I don't think we have any more questions uh, at the moment. So over to Noon. Okay, so- um, Can I ask one question? Yeah, yes, I, I want to ask. Uh, uh, yes, uh, basically when uh, Professor Shamili discussed about the pre-diabetes, so she mentioned the role of metformin to be controversial. So I really want to know what, uh, what she practiced, like, to which patients you prescribe metformin because we see very commonly patients to have either and most commonly they have got impaired fasting and they have run, run normal random blood sugars so we do advise this lifestyle modifications and telling them the risk of developing diabetes and how frequently we're going to screen them but uh, 
like uh, when to start metformin or any other group of drugs like uh, uh, insulin sensitizers? Uh, actually, uh, according to the uh, American Diabetes Association guidelines, uh, they, they recommend the uh, uh, pres prescribing of uh, metformin to patients uh, above 35 BMI. And uh, so that is a level A evidence they are giving. So that is uh, the, I mean, the best evidence we can have. So, uh, but again, for gestational diabetes patients, if they are pre-diabetes and uh, they give it as level A, most of the time, I also agree with you. Like, I mean, our patients being so reluctant to take medication for, I mean, of course, not for less than six years. I really don't give metformin, but I also practice lifestyle modification. Even uh, gestational diabetes patients, if they're like finding it difficult to go for lifestyle modification, then I start them on metformin. But whoever who can really go on a strict uh, lifestyle uh, 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 like uh, changes, then we go along with that. And, but we monitor them frequently to see where they are. But definitely for people more than 35 BMI, yes, we have to give. Right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a question uh, from Anna. Dr. Hara, we have a question that uh, what are the investigations and their, and their frequency uh, that you would suggest for a diabetic patient? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm unmuted now. So you see, I, as I've mentioned in my slide, uh, the list of investigations, if uh, uh, well, the thing is, there are some that are, there are almost all investigations which are done at the initial visit, then we do it at, uh, there are some which are done every quarter, and then that one, those are done um, annually. Uh, so I guess it would, I would recommend that if you can go over the American Diabetic Association guidelines of 2020, there's a lovely chart in there, uh, a table that's made, and it's specifically uh, giving the frequency of investigations as well. Uh, thank you uh, for the answer. We have an, uh, we had a hand raised by uh, Mr. Altaf on. I think it is not there anymore, so maybe it will jump. Okay. Right. So. Um, no, no. Noor, we have some more questions. Uh, sorry, more questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I answer what, this one question uh, about uh, liraglutide in the management of weight loss in pre-diabetic management? Actually, I am not really aware about that, so I can't comment on that. But. Uh, I haven't seen like, I mean, American Diabetes Association guidelines, they don't, uh, even the NICE guidelines, they don't mention anything about this, but uh, obese patients, the weight reduction is very important, but uh, medical nutrition therapy is the one they really recommend and the, uh, along with the exercises. That's why they say like seven to 10% of weight reduction uh, definitely is going to be beneficial. And again, uh, there's another question. Should we start metformin in all patients uh, with pre-diabetes okay. under 60? Again, that is a recommendation by the uh, American Diabetes Association. But that's why I said even I do not really practice it as a routine unless the patient cannot adhere to lifestyle modifications. So if they can... I'll first go for the lifestyle modifications and see whether, I mean, uh, how their sugar uh, sort of is changing or varying, whether it's going up, going down. So 
it's an individual decision I take uh, as a routine. I don't give even if they are in the pre-diabetes because, I mean, uh, we have seen most of our patients revert from the pre-diabetes to normal glycemia with the lifestyle changes. I mean, very quickly, I mean, within a month or two, if they really follow the uh, advice, lifestyle modification, they, their glycemic status becomes normal glycemic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shamili, uh, for answering the question. So I can't see any other questions. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there are any more questions at the moment. Okay, so um, in the end, I would like to thank all of you for celebrating the World Diabetes Day with the Spice Root team. A big uh, note of thanks to all our speakers, Dr. Kalas, Professor Shamali, uh, Samra Naike, and Dr. Anam for their wonderful presentations and contributing their time in creating awareness. Indeed, it was a very informative webinar. Uh, thank you, Harris, uh, our uh, Wonka CEO, Dr. Sankha, our regional spice root chair, and Dr. Zainab, our national uh, chair of Pakistan, for organizing uh, this event. And I would also like to thank Dr. Dure Nishal for moderating such a wonderful uh, session. Thank you all for listening and participating. Have a wonderful weekend and stay safe. Any other comments from any other sites are welcome. Um, yes, no, you, let me everyone. thank you all. Let me thank you all, uh, uh -huh. Sainab and his uh, her, uh, able team. Uh, Dure, Noor, and all the Pakistani Spice Road for uh, organizing such a fine webinar and uh, for all the uh, all the uh, uh, work you did for this and all the coordination you did uh, with the support of all the other countries. Very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.